Every so often, people highlight examples of comedy not aging very well, especially in recent years. Barely a month goes by without stories of episodes from classic sitcoms that are either censored or removed from streaming services for being politically incorrect by modern standards, which in some cases can be understood. But the rule that all comedy past a certain age is outdated and irrelevant doesn't always apply, as comedies from the past continue to find new audiences around the world many decades after they were made. Case in point seems to be the subject of this editorial, the 1937 Will Hay film, Oh Mr. Porter. You might have seen my crew and I review this one back in a more easygoing time, but coming back to it again, while the film shows its age, it doesn't seem to be in its comedy. What's the film about? Spoiler alert, you've been warned. In 1935, so dated by the naming of Gresley's pioneer A4, Silver Link, bumbling railwayman William Porter, played by Hay, keeps messing things up in every job he does. His sister is the wife of the railway's managing director, who insists that Hay is given a decent job. As it happens, a vacancy comes up for a station master at the fictional remote station of Buggles Kelly, on a main line through Northern Ireland, which was actually filmed on a disused branch line in Hampshire. The only problem is, when Hay gets there, he discovers it's a dump that nobody cares about and no trains stop at it. Determined to put it on the map, Hay, along with his staff, Arbottle, played by Moore Marriott, and Albert, played by Graham Moffat, charter an excursion which somehow goes missing. Will they be able to recover it? And how does this tie in to a local myth regarding a phantom miller? If you'd like full details about the making of this film and the other five Hay, Marriott and Moffat collaborations, then I'd recommend seeking out the Will Hay Appreciation Society via numerous social media outlets. But to give all rail fans the basics, in case they weren't aware of them already, the film was mostly shot on the disused line between Alton and Basingstoke, which was being torn up while filming took place. Interestingly, the same line was used during the multi-camera smash-up filmed for The Wrecker of 1929. But while that film took a serious tone, this one is played up for laughs all the way. The station was deliberately dressed down with a washing line across the tracks, a signal box filled with tomato plants, even the locomotive used to help drive the story along was dressed up to look funny. Incidentally, the locomotive which played Gladstone was one of the Hawthorne Leslie 240 tanks delivered new to the Kent and East Sussex Railway in 1900, and actually moved to and from location under her own steam, before being broken up for scrap in World War II. But anyway, let's get to the funny stuff. The writing in particular has been fortunate enough not to rely on dated references. There's no racial slurs in this that were passable then and are not passable now, and while there's a subtle mention of the Canadian quintuplets of 1934, I couldn't come my wife had queen please, but like that woman in Canada, there's no mention of celebrities of the period that nobody would have heard of now. While real places are mentioned by name, it's only the fictional ones that are seen. You'd have to be a die-hard rail fan with a good sense of historic geography to recognise the southern railway locations we see in the film, such as Salisbury Tunnel and the approach to Southampton Central Station. The dialogue, like many of Hayes' films, features wordplay throughout, usually where one word has one meaning but is interpreted as something else. Take this scene where the trio sit down to have breakfast for the first time. Hay is amazed by all the luxury items being offered to him like Danish butter, a wheel of cheese, bacon and eggs, etc., when he learns how it's paid for, i.e. by trading it for tickets instead of money. In future, you'll make sure those tickets come back. Now, well, give them return tickets. Now, to the audience, that's ridiculous, because we know buying a return ticket means paying for a return journey, not handing the ticket back to whoever sold it to you. Although, fun fact, in Steam days, tickets really were handed in at the end of people's journeys. But given the context that the character is a moron trying to maintain his authority, it makes for a simple but funny misunderstanding of what a return ticket is and how it works. But the comedy builds beyond wordplay, such as in the following scene concerning the trading of goods. A farmer who left a pair of pigs at the station comes to collect them, despite Hay being told that his staff may not have been entirely clear about how they feed themselves. It's Murphy called for his pigs. Well, give them to him. Ah, not now. What do you mean, not now? If they're his property, he can have them any time he likes. Well, they're not all of them. Yeah. Not all of them? Well, why not all of them? Where'd you get this bait? That's right. Now, that setup on its own is hilarious, but it builds from there, with a breakdown in communication leading to Hay finding out that the pigs are alive, but there's also a single piglet indicating that Arbottle and Albert cooked its brothers and sisters. Hay tries to stand by the official invoice that makes no mention of a litter, 
in a way highlighting the absurdity of red tape and the loopholes that go with it, while getting more intimidated by the fact that a big angry Irishman is about to smash his face in for eating his property. No, he can't come out. I mean, what, what you can't do, what you don't put in, you can't take out, can you? I mean, it's here for you, you leave it yourself. There you are, the company should be liable in the aggregate for misdelivery, detention, mis uh, negligence, uh, case, uh, more in the separately, uh, uh, if it's left on the premises. There you are, left on the premises. You left two pigs, you can't get down that space, it's a pig staff. He has stolen me litter, I'd sue the company. I'm sorry, Mr. Murphy, but rules are rules, litter or no litter, and I'm acting strictly within the, litter, the letter of the law. He's clearly cacking his pants over it, even though he's technically in the right, and the encounter only ends by Hay mimicking a phone call about a fire at the farmer's farm. When you break down the layers of comedy, it's actually been thought through quite thoroughly. But there's much simpler gags too, like this moment when the express train is made to stop at the station in just the wrong place. Can't you move up a bit? No. Can't you move up a couple of yards? Oh, go away. Well, a couple of inches in. Get away with you. Here, what's the trouble here? Yeah, what's all the noise about? Well, goodbye, Ben. It's probably one of the silliest blink and you'll miss it moments in the film, but it's also become one of its best remembered jokes. But let's face it, the most famous scene in the film is the three of them debating changing the clocks to British summertime. To adjust the service to the new time, the 11 o'clock express on this day, we run at 12 o'clock summertime. Well, what are we hurrying about? We've got two hours. How can you make out we got two hours? Well, if we put the clocks back an hour, the train's an hour late, then it's two hours, isn't it? Hey, you put the clocks forward and the train back. Well, what do we get then? We've got the express coming any minute. Yeah. What are you talking about? Listen, if the train's an hour late, how can it be coming now? It's summertime. Summertime? <laughs> the old fool's potty. Summertime or wintertime, if a train's late, it's late. Yeah, that's right. I thought you put the clock forward. Well, if the clocks go forward, then the train's already gone. No, 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 you put the clocks back. It plays up to the chemistry between the three of them stumbling over each other's words. But what makes it so hilarious is they're having this conversation at the most inconvenient possible moment. It's arguably the scene that everybody remembers the most. The climax itself, while barely four minutes long, is where the situation becomes the most ridiculous. Having stumbled upon their excursion train, the trio recapture it and run away to prevent the onboard criminals from escaping, and it allows for multiple layers of comedy to build up. You could simply look at the film being sped up for comedic effects and think it's little more than a Benny Hill sight gag. But there's physical humour, callbacks from earlier in the plot, even little reminders of how Hay shows his naivety while trying to maintain his authority. I know, I was just to speak by the telegraph I won't spoil what happens at the very end of the film to anybody who by some chance haven't seen it before, but let's say it keeps playing for the laughs right up until the final minute, but somehow manages to squeeze in a bizarrely Shakespearean moment right in the closing scenes, in a sense that it briefly tries to be as sad as it is hilarious. But what sort of influence has this film had down the years? People are forever saying the Titfield Thunderbolt of 1953 was a comedy. Now I know all humour is subjective and I apologise to anyone who disagrees with this, but... Really? Titfield was a comedy? I mean there are some funny scenes and funny lines in there, but the level of comedy seems to rely more on unique pastimes rather than ridiculous situations. If you look at the situations between the two of them, Titfield's isn't so much funny as it is dramatic, i.e. will the railway close or not? But the things that happen within the situation, i.e. racing a bus, fighting a steamroller, taking on water from a river using every household appliance you can think of, are where the jokes are based around. In Oh Mr. Porter, the situation is the biggest joke, i.e. an incompetent hero who's put in charge of two other incompetent heroes running a chicken shed that's so far out of the way that nobody else really cares about it. The gags and set pieces that happen within simply add to the humour, from little things like waking up next to a cow or having brown sauce served to you from an oil can, to big things like getting stuck on a windmill or runaway engines. You could almost argue the situation inspires comparisons to Father Ted. Sort of. I mean, the rundown punishment setting of Buggles Kelly is similar to the rundown punishment setting of Craggy Island, in so much as you wouldn't really want to be there for the long run. Will Hay is obviously Ted in this scenario, trying to make the best of a bad situation. But admittedly, Graham Moffat is a lot brighter than Dougal, and while Moore Marriott plays the toothless old man who drinks in this film, he doesn't shout any drunken extremities. Ice biscuits! A more timely comparison would be that of the Ghost Train stage play, which loosely inspired the screenplay for this film, by Arnold Ridley, Daisy Ridley's grandfather who played Godfrey in Dad's Army. The plot focuses on a group of passengers who have to spend a night at a haunted station in the middle of nowhere after the last train has gone. 
And spoiler alert, the mysterious train in both of these stories actually turns out to be run by a gang of gunrunners. Or Nazi sympathisers if you've seen the Arthur Askey version. Speaking of Dad's Army, writer Jimmy Perry described this film as one of his favourites, and you can sort of see the influence Will Hay had on his work. There's the dynamic of old and young generations being managed by a bumbling authority figure in Dad's Army and Heidi High, complemented by a mixture of slapstick and visual gags blended with quick verbal lines and memorable set pieces. Maybe that's one of the reasons why this film has aged better than expected, because not only does the dialogue not suffer the misfortune of bits that wouldn't be acceptable now, but other works have been inspired by the situation and character dynamics down the years. Even in slightly more recent years, British comedian Harry Enfield did a loving pastiche of the trio's iconic summertime scene. Look, now this is a jelly night. Is it safe? No, that's the safe. This is a jelly night. Right, now where's the charge? What's the charge? Robbing a bank. How can a charge be robbing a bank when we haven't even robbed it yet? Of course you do. You lengthen the day by taking an hour off the end and sticking it on the beginning. No, no, no. You take an hour off the beginning and stick it on the end. That's winter time. Now, winter time, you put them back. Well, that's what I said. Oh, you said to put it back for summertime. It's so well done. I swear you could switch the actors out and it wouldn't feel that different. It's easy to assume such dynamics have led to other works too, such as another David Croft sitcom, Oh, Dr. Beeching. It's set in a country railway station, there's a new authority figure who's trying to get a grip of things but is forever being left in the know by his staff. It has the word O in the title, so it's easy to assume one is directly influenced by the other, right? Well, according to writer Richard Spendlove in a letter he wrote to Will Hay appreciator Tom Marshall, Beeching wasn't influenced at all by O Mr Porter, but by Spendlove's experience working for BR. Any similarity to Will Hay's work is put down to coincidence. With all that being said though, does this film really appeal to multiple generations on its own, or is the appeal down to extended nostalgia passed down from previous generations? Well, there may be some different perspectives. While some of the jokes are very blink and you'll miss it, they don't exactly push too many envelopes. The quality of this film has diminished with a level of distortion you come to expect with films of that period, and sometimes the set pieces, while funny and memorable, can get in the way of the plot. It's easy to get carried away with something you enjoy, and I'm not going to pretend that this film will appeal to absolutely everybody who ever lived, but like I said before, there are scenes in newer films which make them controversial nowadays, whereas you could put on any scene from this film today, and chances are, it would barely come close to hurting anybody by comparison. I mean, heaven forbid this happens, but given the number of remakes that are being made these days, if you had to remake a film such as Airplane or Ace Ventura Pet Detective, there are certain scenes and elements in both of those films that you would either have to change or remove altogether for the sake of a modern audience. Whereas with Oh Mr Porter, you could take the existing screenplay and have to change pretty much nothing. But to anyone who thinks about remaking this film, just don't. Please, just don't. Why not make something original, like adapting Jenny or the Railway Phantoms instead, because they're both crying out for adaptation. But anyway, what else could possibly be said about this that hasn't already been said? Oh Mr Porter is a classic, and if you haven't seen it, then feel free to check it out. In a world where people say comedy ages like fried milk, this one seems to have aged more like whiskey by comparison. Not everybody's taste, admittedly, but compared to what's of similar vintage, it's less likely to go off. I'm Chris, and I'm here to gauge the issue. Time and time again I lost my mind